Hi, I'm James McIlvenny, and you're listening to the History and Philosophy of the Language Sciences podcast, online at hifilangsci.net. There you can find links and references to all the literature we discuss. Today we're joined by Nick Riemer, who's lecturer in linguistics and English at the University of Sydney in Australia, and also associated with the laboratory History of Linguistic Theories in Paris. Nick has a broad range of interests in the study of language, most notably in semantics, history and philosophy of linguistics, and the politics of linguistics. It's these political dimensions of linguistic scholarship that Nick is going to talk to us about today. His current project is a monograph on the politics of linguistics since Saussure. So Nick, what have the politics of linguistics been like since Saussure? Well, thanks a lot for inviting me on the, on the podcast, James. And obviously, there's no single answer to, to that question. And in fact, you know, many linguists since Saussure have denied that there is any connection between linguistics and politics. It's a surprisingly common declaration that you come across linguists making throughout the 20th century that these two things actually have no, you know, connection. And it's sort of reflected, I think, in the conventional historiography of linguistics. I mean, you can tell me whether you agree with this, but it seems to me that the way we usually talk about linguistics and politics is by talking about how particular ideas and theories and frameworks in linguistics might reflect external trends in, in society and politics. And it's often struck me that that's a sort of overly passive way of construing the relationship, and it ignores the fact that linguistics doesn't just reflect what's going on outside it, it also contributes to it, shapes it, plays an ideological function in reinforcing or, or, or challenging it. And, and that's what I'm interested in, you know, in the, in the period after Saussure. And I think that, you know, to answer, to, to try and answer your question a, a little bit, because the connections are just so vast and manifold, I think the key is to seeing linguistics as a social practice, um, to seeing it not in idealist terms, as a body of doctrine or discoveries which unfolds according to its own internal logic and in which the, the, the theorists and the participants are these purely disinterested, you know, truth seekers, but to see it as something which unfolds largely in the context of higher education in a social context where the players themselves are engaged in political tussles internally within the field, but where the discipline also does arguably perform various ideological and polit political functions. But why, why focus on linguistics? I mean, it's a fairly niche discipline, isn't it, within the university landscape? Because I had the, the misfortune or the, the folly to, you know, become a specialist in, in part of, of linguistics and from that got on to taking an interest in the history and the, and the philosophy of the discipline. So, you know, to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I'm just, you know, in, in embarking on this project, I'm, as we all do, working on what I know and what I feel I can make some, some contribution to. Obviously, you can't separate the history of linguistics from the wider history of the human sciences and from wider intellectual history, even though for much of the 20th century, especially its later part, I would say there has been a certain isolationism in, in the discipline. And it's certainly notable, I think, that, you know, linguistics in the West was to a, a large and surprising extent immune for for instance, from the waves of sort of social critique and political critique that swept over the rest of the humanities and the social sciences from, from the 1960s. I mean, there were versions of that that did touch linguistics, but it has been a quite sort of technical and scientific and rather sort of isolationist discipline. And I think that performs an ideological function in itself, actually. Okay, but do you think that that represents linguistics as an entire discipline or just particular schools of linguistics? Because, I mean, you could argue that linguistics as a field has actually served as a model science, as a model to many of the other human sciences, uh, especially in the 20th century. And in fact, that a lot of post-structuralist theory is a reaction to structuralism, a body of doctrines that have come out 
of linguistics. Yeah, absolutely it is. And there's no doubt that structuralism was a, a pilot science, as it was uh, as it was often called, for, and had a, a massive influence. And there was this sort of linguistification of the world that happened in the wake of structural linguistics, where it looked as though for a while everything could be treated as though it was a language which operated on structuralist principles. I mean, I suppose Lacan is the most celebrated version of that. But at one point in the 60s and 70s, you know, it looked as though everything had a grammar. You know, music had a grammar, dance had a grammar, urban planning had a grammar, everything had a grammar. And I think that's one of the things that makes asking questions about the politics of our ideas about language interesting, that the that the language is a sort of model, as you say, for a whole lot of other symbolic and also maybe non-symbolic domains. So it's interesting to inquire into the, you know, the, the underlying political assumptions that, that might drive research into, into language structure. Because if I, perhaps I can just elaborate on that slightly. I mean, you know, when we talk about language and politics and language and society, I think we're really used to looking at the obvious things. So we're looking, we look often at the contribution of language to, of linguistics to colonialism. So it's, you know, it's, it's use as part of ex, expert knowledge among, among colonizers in the, in the service of control of colonial populations. We look at language standardization which is about a similar dynamic within the West, uh, the dispossession, the linguistic dispossession of subaltern classes by particular, you know, certified registers of, of national languages, which were typically not the ones that were spoken by, you know, rural and working class populations, but which was imposed on them as, as part of the project of, you know, universal primary education. Language planning, you know, the way that language planning is done to serve particular political ends. So that's all very interesting. And I think in linguistics in general, we do have a, a reasonable understanding of that. And it's certainly very salient, you know, linguistics and racism, linguistics and class uh, exploitation. These are well understood. But what we have less of an interest in, I think, and which I myself find really worth exploring, is the way in which our basic structural ideas about the nature of grammar might be the product of, and might also reinforce particular ideological settings, which play a role in, for want of a better word, Western European or Anglo-European capitalist modernity. And I think there are a lot of interesting things that we can say about that. So if I might just query the specifics of your historiographic scheme, why do you start your discussion of the modern field of linguistics with Saussure's course in general linguistics. So, I mean, there's of course a tradition of treating Saussure's course as the founding scripture of modern synchronic linguistics. But there's also plenty of historical scholarship that shows that this is largely a convenient myth, that there's a great deal of continuity between Saussure and what came before him, and what came immediately before him, that is, uh, namely the neo-grammarians. Um, and also that a lot of what is considered Saussurean is in fact later interpretation that people have made in setting up Saussure's course as the scripture uh, that they base you know, all of their ideas on. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that you know, there are lots of continuities, as you say, between the course, which of course wasn't from Saussure's own pen, but which was a retrospective reconstruction by, by his colleagues on the, on the basis of, of lecture notes, as we all know. There's an obvious continuity between that and the, the memoir on the vowel system. Um, there are similar sort of structuralist, for want of a better term, ideas that you can see in both of them, I think. But... To the extent that any starting point for any project is arbitrary, as of course it is, I still think there are good grounds for starting with Saussure because retrospectively that text was imbued with an enormous weight uh, in the structuralist period. Uh, you know, maybe not immediately, but, you know, in the 50s, certainly, people looked back to, and, and earlier as well, people did look back to, you know, Saussure as the sort of founding charter of this new intellectual movement, which was by no means just Saussurean, but which did appeal to 
many of the ideas in the course in general linguistics as as the starting point for this exciting new way of thinking about language. And I mean, if we just look at, at two aspects of Saussure, I think we can, you know, see that there is a, a reason to take the course seriously as a, as a starting point. One is the concept of synchrony, you know, the idea that there needs to be a, a break with the predominantly sort of historical mode of in, investigation of language, which was true of the comparative historical method and, and then of neo-grammarianism. Neo and the other is this abstraction that Saussure, you know, really popularised or that the course really popularised, which is long. You know, the idea that there is some kind of abstract formal structure at the heart of language which can be meaningfully studied uh, out of connection with actual acts of language use, actual discourse, actual linguistic interchange. And that really set the stage, I think, in important ways for the whole formalisation, for the whole abstraction that, linguist that became so such a feature and hallmark of linguistic science, quote unquote, in the, in the, in the, in the subsequent decades. And there's really interesting things, I think, that we can say about the, the ideological valency of, of, both of both of those things, this divestment that Saussure accomplished of language from the historical flow, the situated historical flow of temporal, you know, human in interaction embedded in all of those things which, you know, give human interaction its particular characteristics, you know, our, our gender, our ethnic background, our particular position in whatever speech community and society we're in. All of these things Saussure was seen as providing a licence to ignore or at, least, or at least to background. And I think we can see in that, you know, a particular, a recognisable move that we see widely, I would say, in bourgeois culture, which is just a, a backgrounding of social conflict and social tensions and the class character of society, and also particularly the problems of racialization and the racialization of different linguistic subjects. All of that is largely backgrounded by the decision to look at this thing which is called long and to take language out of the social contexts that it, it really surely belongs in, in a significant way. So that's one, I think, interesting way in which what became doctrine in linguistics did contribute to this image that liberal society, that bourgeois liberal society has of itself in the West, which is this, is this fantasy of a social homogeneity and this backgrounding of society as this dialectical, conflict-ridden, intrinsically contradictory thing out of which, you know, transformative social change could arise if we only let it. Okay, but I mean, a counter-argument, or perhaps it's not a counter-argument, but one thing that has been said about this idea of, of la langue, or as it later became in generative theory, competence, or at least Chomsky has argued that his notion of competence is a version of la langue, although that, of course, is controversial. But one argument that has been made in support of that, which you may simply dismiss as bourgeois rationalization is that having this notion that everyone, all people, have exactly the same linguistic ability, which manifests itself in competence uh, or in along, means that everyone is the same. So it's a radically egalitarian move. One way in which this argument has been deployed is in defense of Creole languages. So Michel de Graff, who is a generativist at MIT, has argued that uh, all humans have this capacity for language and that it's the same, means that Creole languages are legitimate languages of the same kind as any standard European language that might have lexified them or any other language in the world. So, so what would you say to an argument like that? I mean, I think that's certainly true. It's certainly true that, you know, the 
the starting hypothesis of the generative enterprise is that there is this thing which we have in virtue of our membership of the human species, which is this unique uniform language acquisition device or universal grammar or whatever we want to call it. I mean, some people have interpreted that as a sort of anti-fascist gesture or anti-racist gesture, and I think it, it certainly lends itself to that. Although Chomsky has been very sort of toey about uh, strongly drawing that connection between what he thinks of as his scientific enterprise and any kind of ideological or political conclusions that you could draw from it. But I think the connection is there and it's obvious and he, he doesn't deny it either. It's also worth saying that it's not unique to generativism. I mean, there are plenty of people you can find in the history of linguistics before Chomsky asserting strongly the uh, you know, universality of human language and, the, and challenging the idea that some languages were primitive or less, less developed than others. So Sure, but I raised the, this question at this point because I think that it ties into this, you know, to the critique you made of long and by extension competence as, as a bourgeois rationalization. Yeah, the, the extent to which I think, I mean, it's interesting to see, you know, what led Chomsky into, into his distinctive mode of approach to, to linguistics. And of course, what got him into it in the first place was his connection with Zelig Harris, who was strongly identified with socialistic politics in the US in the 40s. So the very impetus for, for Chomsky's whole model was a, a stringently left-wing one, which was about collectivism and which was, uh, you know, an, an anti-Bolshevik kind of socialism, I, I think. So historically, to tie it to bourgeois politics in that way does miss something important about at least the impetus that Chomsky had to get involved with, with that whole sort of project or to initiate that project in the first place. And even if we can recognise that there's this hypothesis of equality, which is just embedded there in the, in the generative approach, there's another way in which it really does buy in, I think, to characterist, a characteristic ideological formation in, in late capitalism, which is just its individualism, right? You know, it's a highly individualistic way of approaching language to the extent that Chomsky has quite often, you know, said, or Chomskyans have quite often, I think, said that, you know, really we all have an individual idiolect. So there's this disavowal of the shared nature of language. There's also this idea that language ultimately isn't about communication at, at root. It's about the expression of thought. So these are ideas which really put the focus on the individual and background social determinants of linguistic behaviour in a way that, for example, conversation analysis, which you've you know, discussed on the, on the podcast recently, tried to address, you know, in, in some ways at least. So that sort of hyper-individualism is, I think, a very... That's a very it buys into a, a standard default way of conceiving of society in our kind of world which is society as an aggregate of individuals. I mean, you know, Thatcher famously said there's no such thing as society, and it's famous. But in a way, linguists have been saying that for decades before it came out of Margaret Thatcher's mouth. And it's interesting to think of linguists not just saying that, but saying that in lectures to very large numbers of undergraduates and saying it with the authority or claiming the authority of, in, of science for it in the way that Chomsky claims the authority of science. And I think it's interesting to ask what kind of ideological contribution our discipline is making to the maintenance of this whole deeply exploitative, deeply ecocidal economic order, which is catapulting us into environmental destruction and social upheaval and permanent war. Now, what is the contribution of linguists and of the discipline to that ideologically? And that's one of the questions that I want to ask, not blaming linguistics for everything by any means. By, that would be ludicrous. But just acknowledging that this thing we do, this discipline that we're in, is caught up with all of these things in ways that have often been disavowed or at least silenced under this claim of scientificity that, that we like to make. Sure. But I mean, radical individualism of the Chomskyan kind could also be an anarchist move, right? It's not necessarily neoliberal. 
No, no, it's not. And that is obviously the political affiliation that Chomsky has claimed for it. And, you know, he said with respect to, I mean, he's, he's, he was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. So, you know, his political affiliations, formally speaking, absolutely aren't in doubt. But, you know, ideology has this nasty way of escaping from you. And it, it is interesting to think about, you know, the and I mean, Chomsky has just been, he's, he's had this schizophrenic split, of course, between his linguistic work and his political activism, which has been, in my view, you know, exemplary in, in, in many ways. And he has, he certainly cannot be accused and shouldn't be accused of being on the wrong side. I mean, you know, he has doggedly fought against, you know, US power, for example, doggedly fought against, you know, the abuses of Zionism, to give another example, doggedly fought against, you know, uh, interference by the US in the governments of the the developing world. So, you know, his politics are, are not in doubt. But what is in doubt is the ideological tenor or valency of this model that he contributed to. And, you know, if we look at people like George Lakoff or Steven Pinker, for example, you know, they're perhaps the two neo-Chomskyans or people with a Chomskyan, with Chomskyan linguistics in their background who've most explicitly contributed to political discourse and have tried to weigh into political debate in the US. And it's interesting to look at how they do that. You know, Lakoff has done it in the favour of, in my view, completely dead-end Democrat politics of the most, you know, uh, the, the most sort of counterproductive kind. Uh, Pinker is a neo-reactionary of very of a very clear stripe, yet they both have, you know, adopted those individualistic, highly intellectualist approaches to, to politics, which I think have their roots in Chomskyan ideas about the nature of the mind. So if I can just ask one more question, do you think these developments in linguistics of having an abstract notion of la langue, which is examined synchronically, so separate from any notion of history, are entirely internal to the discipline? Or do you think that there are external forces that might have helped to shape this image of language that linguists support, such as technological developments in the 20th century? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. And obviously any kind of answer is, is speculative. But one of the things that we can say about the context in which, you know, important thinkers in the 20th century developed their ideas about language is that it was a context of the progressive and sort of galloping autonomization of language from human speakers. So you see that in the development of broadcast technology, of things like the telex, of things like the networked computer, and then more recently of, uh, you know, technological innovations like, you know, automatic text generation, text translation, uh, you know, AI. So there is this sense in which throughout the 20th century, language is being increasingly separated from its base in live human in interaction. And I don't think we have to be, you know, starry-eyed romantics to see that as the natural niche of language. It is in embodied, socially situated interaction. And ever since Gutenberg, or ever since the invention of writing, in fact, linguistics has been in part of this dynamic of this increasing and now, as I said, galloping autonomization. You know, the, the freeing of language from bondage to actual flesh and blood speakers. You know, the, 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 the emancipation of language from the spoken word, which has just gathered pace astonishingly. And I do think that notions like long and competence can be seen as part of, of that dynamic, this idea that language is at root an abstract system. And I think it was, no doubt, in complicated ways, reinforced by that, at least. And I also think that it, there's another interesting angle here, maybe, which is that one of the things that we... One of the ways we typically talk about language, we talk about ourselves as using language. And this increasing reification of language, this way that linguists increasingly had of hauling language out of its interactional basis in interaction between people and of treating it as this, you know, mathematizable formal system, 
This is reification writ large. And what I mean by that is the treatment of something which is fundamentally a social process as a thing, which can be uh, you know, manipulated by a sovereign subject, by a subject who is free and uh, rational and able to just use this system to achieve its own goals and to achieve its own ends. In the ideal case, and in the case that's assumed, in a way that's pretty much free of social determinants. You know, we've got the linguis linguistic system out there at the disposal of the free linguistic subject, who's like homo economicus in the linguistic domain. You know, they just make a rational means end calculation. They use whatever words best express whatever ideas they have in their head, which are aimed at achieving their particular interactional ends, you know, getting what they want. That, I think, has been the sort of model of language that is often not articulated as crassly as that, though sometimes it is. But I think it's, it underlies so much of the way we think about language, and it's particularly not challenged by so much of, you know, scientific linguistics. And that reification, I think, participates in this same sort of ideological complex that I've been talking about, in that it, it feeds in and reinforces and does reflect um, this view we have of what society is under capitalism, which is this collection of rational individuals who are unconstrained in using their intelligences to improve their particular individual situations in competition often with, with other people. Um, and our view of language just buys into that very uncritical, very, you know, unsociological, very sort of Pollyanna-ish conception of the way society works, where society is not something which is fundamentally riven with class conflict, but where it's something where there are free agents who, sure, are in competition with each other for various goods, but they're in competition on an individualistic basis, and everything that we need to say about them can be understood as rational. So, you know, that's the other really striking thing about linguistics in the 20th century. It's hyper-rationalism. It's hyper-intellectualism. The way that emotions just got screened out, but maybe we can talk about that another day. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions. Thanks very much for having me, James.